Hello and welcome to another short video for the 12 Lead ECG I've Got The Rhythm Facebook group. In this episode we will be looking at some case studies that have been previously posted to the group and using them to discuss and explore posterior ST elevation MI. Occlusion of the coronary artery supplying the posterior wall of the myocardium may result in a posterior infarction and the potential benefits of PPCI through cath lab activation is obvious. Although posterior infarct in isolation is uncommon, it still does account for around 8% of MIs. Given that the standard 12 lead ECG can give us information regarding ischemia and infarctions of the inferior, lateral and anterior walls, how can we differentiate between ST depression caused by ischemia from the small percentage of MIs affecting the posterior wall? There are a number of other conditions that cause ST depression and T-wave inversions. An LVH with strain pattern is just one such example. For the purpose of this video, however, we will be considering ST depression from ischemic causes versus the ST depression suggestive of a posterior MI. Myocardial ischemia causing ST depression tends to be seen in various leads with varying morphology. An ST depression which is seen in localised leads, such as the inferior or high lateral leads, that tends to be reciprocal change to a STEMI elsewhere. And subendocardial ST depression is usually seen in leads 1 and 2 and V4 through to V6. A posterior MI should be suspected when leads V1 to V3 have ST depression and also have tall R waves, although not having tall R waves shouldn't stop you doing a posterior view of the heart. For some pre-hospital providers, obtaining a posterior ECG is not necessarily required, but it is quite a simple and relatively quick thing to do. And there is more than one method to get a posterior view of the myocardial wall, but for this video we'll look at one of the simplest. Here we can see ST depression in leads V2 and V3, both with quite tall R waves, and we've also got some ST depression in lead V1 as well. So we're quite suspicious in this patient for posterior infarction. We're going to want to go ahead then and record an ECG looking at the posterior view. And to do this, we remove leads V5 and V6, put another couple of electrodes on the patient's back, as can be seen in this diagram, and we're going to call those leads V7 and V8. Print off another ECG. And you can annotate at the top that it is a posterior ECG, but importantly, where you've got leads V5 and V6, we now need to cross these out and relabel them as V7 and V8. And what we're looking for in those two leads is 0.5 millimetres or more of ST elevation in both of them. It's quite small because if you think of the small boxes on the uh, ECG paper, one of those small boxes is one millimetre in height. So you can imagine 0.5 millimetres is very, very small indeed. But if we've got that elevation or more in both of those leads, then that's confirmation on our ECG of a posterior myocardial infarction. Let's take a look then at some cases taken from the 12 lead ECG Facebook group and consider the differential of a posterior STEMI versus myocardial ischemia. Credit for these upcoming ECGs goes to Emily Grist, Lou Brazier, Richard Armour and Silas Budd. So our thanks go to them for sharing these cases. In our first ECG submitted by Emily, we can see ST depression in leads V1, V2 and V3. So straight away, we're going to be considering a posterior STEMI as the cause. You can see here that the computer reads this as an abnormal ECG with ST depression suggestive of myocardial injury or ischemia. For us though, we're concerned that this could be a posterior infarction and the treatment for that would be very, very different. So let's go ahead and place our electrodes posteriorly and record a V7 and a V8. In this case, Emily chose to use leads V4 and V5 to record V7 and V8, which is fine because it's not the choice of leads that are important. It's the ST elevation of 0.5 millimetres or more we are looking for to confirm posterior STEMI. And from this ECG, we can see that we have that elevation. If we look here in V7 and here in V8, it's probably a little bit more than 0.5 millimetres of elevation, making it easier for us. But we have that elevation in both leads and that all but confirms this as a posterior infarction. Also, we can now see that the computer interpretation reads this as meeting ST elevation criteria. 
And our treatment for this patient is going to be very different now than if that ST depression had just been from an ischemic cause. Okay then, let's go and have a look at another case. This ECG submitted by Lou was for a patient in their 60s with a three day history of intermittent central chest pain. The patient was treated with ACS drugs, which relieved symptoms, although unfortunately perhaps they were not accepted direct for PPCI due to the three day history. If we look at the ECG though, our eyes are drawn to the most obvious abnormality, which is the bigeminal rhythm with the premature ventricular contractions. That's why we should always look at ECGs with a systematic approach and is something we covered in an earlier episode. For the purpose of this video, we can focus on leads V1 to V3. And if we forget the fact there are premature ventricular ectopics, so I'm going to scrub those out so we can ignore those. But we can see that in the normally conducted complexes, there's ST depression with tall R waves. So in V1, we've got ST depression, V2, ST depression, tall R wave. V3, ST depression with tall R wave. So this ECG is highly suspicious of a posterior STEMI. And that suspicion is supported by the fact that V6 is also slightly elevated. So again, get rid of the ventricular ectopics there and look at the normally conducted B. We can see that the elevation there is slight in V6. Unfortunately, a posterior ECG was not submitted by Lou but she did do one using three leads instead of two, and she reported a small amount of ST elevation in V7 to V9. I don't know the outcome for this patient, but given the history together with this ECG, then posterior STEMI is highly likely. So what about this ECG submitted by Richard for a patient in their early 90s with upper back pain radiating into their shoulders? Could this also be a posterior STEMI? Well, there is ST depression in leads V2, albeit small, and V3, the tall R wave, and that would make us suspicious. But should we be thinking posterior STEMI or another cause? If we look elsewhere on this ECG, there is widespread ST depression, and we can see that depression from the high lateral leads through the inferior, round and up to the left-sided chest leads also. So this is more suggestive of ischemia and is most likely subendocardial ischemia. So is there anything else we can see on this ECG? Well, if we look at lead AVR, there is ST elevation of more than one millimeter, as we can see there. And according to the computer, that's 1.47 millimeters in height. And there's also some ST elevation in lead V1, albeit very, very small and possibly difficult to see. And according to the computer, that's 0.86 millimetres. And as we already know, V2 has got ST depression, albeit very slight. Just underline it over there. So this ECG suggests that the patient is ACS and they've perhaps got a left main coronary stenosis or triple vessel disease and is in need of a bypass graft rather than someone who's having an acute posterior STEMI. Being thorough though, Richard did do a posterior ECG, which is absolutely fine and it's not inappropriate and shouldn't be considered detrimental to the patient's treatment. This is because as noted earlier, there's a relatively simple and quick procedure to do. And in addition, this patient is unlikely to require emergent cath lab activation anyway. So from this ECG, also using three leads, V7, V8 and V9, we can see that we don't meet the 0.5 millimetre or more elevation required to treat this as a, a posterior STEMI. So we're looking at the complexes there. And then if we look at what the computer reads those at, we can see it's not 0.5 millimeters or more. So again, this is uh, more likely a patient who's got a, a left main coronary artery stenosis or triple vessel disease. On to our fourth and final ECG then. Here we again see ST depression in leads V1, V2, in V3, and it also extends up here into V4. Um, so is this a posterior STEMI? It is quite possible, but there are some other subtle changes elsewhere on this ECG. And remember we said earlier that posterior STEMI is less common in isolation. So looking at AVL, there appears to be some ST depression there, albeit very subtle. And the inferior leads look suspicious for elevation with maybe proportionally large T waves.
So if we look here, the T waves and the ST elevation in these leads are somewhat suspicious. So there could be something else going on, but let's go ahead and take a look at the posterior view. Here is the posterior view recorded by Silas, but we don't see the ST elevation. We would need to consider this a posterior MI. Again, he used leads V4 and V5 as V7 and V8. So what else could be going on then? Well, the third ECG taken about 20 minutes later could give us the answer. And here we see an obvious inferior STEMI. The ST depression, along with the subtle inferior changes from the first ECG, were likely the early indicators of a right coronary artery occlusion with posterior wall involvement. So not a posterior STEMI, but certainly a good argument for undertaking posterior ECGs in the context of this video. And for continuous ECG monitoring of a symptomatic patient in which ACS has not been ruled out as the cause of their chest pain. To recap then, Posterior infarction accounts for about 8% of STEMIs. There are several causes for ST depression, but we should consider a posterior infarction when the depression is in leads V1 to V3. Recording a posterior ECG should be easy and a quick thing to do. And continuous monitoring of our patients is an absolute must. And finally, when associated with a STEMI, Posterior view is not really relevant, so we don't need to go ahead and record another ECG and get that posterior view because our treatment of the patient is not going to change. All we're going to do is delay at a definitive care and transport to hospital. I will finish then by saying thank you for watching. Hopefully you find these short videos both helpful and easy to understand. Goodbye for now. Hope to see you all again soon.